My name is Dr. Sarah Myhill. I'm here uh, speaking for Life, the Basic Manual, which is all about teaching people to um, look after themselves. And my particular interest is in chronic fatigue syndrome. And so often in chronic fatigue syndrome, we have a chronic infection. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we go about treating chronic infection? Now that in my fatigue syndrome patients and indeed patients I see with arthritis and other inflammatory conditions, these um, infections can be viral, they can be um, bacterial, they can be parasitic, um, or they can be fungal. And essentially in treating any chronic infection, there's a two-pronged approach. Firstly, we have to improve the defences. And then secondly, we have to um, attack that microbe um, uh, in ways that are specific to that microbe. So starting off with improving the defences. And you know, I think of treating chronic infection as siege warfare. And, and you know, when Henry V you know, besieged um, um, Harfleur in 1415, um, he didn't just um, use a battering ram or throw spears over the top or poison the water or undermine the walls, he did it all. The point being here is that the more interventions you can put in place, the better. Now we have got used to one, anti one bug, one antibiotic, one cure. It's not like that anymore. It's much more complicated. And the more you can do to help, the better. So let's start off with how you can improve your defences. And the starting point, of course, is, the, is diet. And there are two aspects to diet. Um, the first point is we have to reduce the carbohydrate content of that diet. Why? Because all microbes love to live on sugar and carbohydrates. You know, and uh, diabetics, for example, often present with some sort of chronic infection. Cutting out the carbohydrates in the diet um, is a very difficult thing to do, and I will discuss that um, uh, uh, at another session. But um, um, if you can reduce the carbohydrates, you reduce the fermenting gut, um, and um, you lower the blood sugar. If you lower the blood sugar, you stop sugar oozing onto the skin, oozing um, um, into the lungs, oozing into the tissues, where microbes can then make themselves at home. Um, the second point about the diet is to eat foods that make the gut less leaky. Now, 95% of all infection comes in through the mouth. If it comes in in food, we, should, uh, we swallow that food and it should get killed by acid in the stomach. Um, what stops us producing acid? Fermenting gut. So again, it's back to a low carbohydrate diet. Even microbes that we inhale get stuck on sticky mucus that lines the uh, bronchi, coughed up and swallowed. So all infection that comes into the body should end up in an acid bath of the stomach. If we don't have that acid bath of the stomach, then um, we are susceptible to infections. And as, as I, I will reiterate again, it's carbohydrates and sugars that um, um, cause fermenting gut and fermenting gut will cause leaky gut. And we know gluten causes leaky gut directly. It interferes with the tight junctions between cells. So we, if we have leaky gut, we can't concentrate acid and we can't kill microbes. So the paleo ketogenic diet, as I, call, as I call it, is an absolute essential starting point for infections. And in fact, I say to my patients, it's really not worth me giving you any micro antimicrobials until you're going to do that diet. There's no point killing microbes with antimicrobials, which might be antibiotic or herbals, if you're feeding them at the same time, because that is a breeding ground for resistant strains of bacteria, yeast, um, viruses, or whatever. The second thing we have to do is we have to give those uh, people the um, micronutrients to allow their immune system um, to function. And so all my patients, I give them a good multivitamin, which is one tablet they have to swallow, obviously. The sunshine salt, which goes on food normally, and then hemp oil, which is, um, uh, has the right balance of omega-6 to omega-3, and again, that can be used in the diet. Um, and another reason I love to do that is I can treat other members of my family and they don't know I'm treating them. <laughs> A very, very powerful tool against in any infection, regardless of what the infection is, is vitamin C. Now, the, the vitamin C is not used as a drug. Why? Because the people can't make money out of it. You can't patent vitamin C. It, it's, it's, um, um, it's a natural product. But it's an incredibly powerful pool. Now, the tool, the interesting thing about vitamin C is it kills everything. There is no virus, there is no parasite, there's no bacteria, there's no yeast that is um, resistant to vitamin C. They are all killed by it. 
The difficulty is getting a sufficient dose into the body. And um, so I routinely advocate taking vitamin C to bowel tolerance. Now this has all sorts of spin-offs because taking vitamin C to bowel tolerance is very helpful treatment for the fermenting gut. And in fact, that two-pronged approach of a ketogenic diet, starved little wretches, taking vitamin C to bowel tolerance goes an awful long way to treating fermenting guts and infections. Now there's been some lovely work done on vitamin C. Most recently, um, a doctor called Malik who um, um, uh, is a specialist in infectious diseases. He works in America, um, runs um, an ITU unit specializing in septicemia. Now, septicemia is bacterial infection of the blood. People die from it. And with the best possible care, all the antibiotics, all the oxygen, all the supportive therapy, um, his mortality rate in his unit is about 40%. When he adds vitamin C into his regime, that reduces to 1%. It's a fantastically powerful tool. He gives it intravenously. Um, side effects, none. Kidney problems, none. Um, results, fantastic. This echoes other work done, for example, by Dr. Robert Cathcart. Now, he published in Medical Hypothesis, 1981, um, giving patients vitamin C to bowel tolerance. Now, what he found that was so interesting is that the sicker the patient, the greater their bowel tolerance. So. Um, a normal person should be able to, um, by bowel tolerance, I mean the moment at which you get diarrhea. Normal people should tolerate between 5 grams of vitamin C a day and 15 grams a day. Linus Pauling, only man to win two Nobel Prizes in his own right, spent the last um, third of his life simply doing research into vitamin C and promoting it um, as, a, as a wonderful antibiotic therapeutic agent. Not antibiotic, antimicrobial therapeutic agent. It kills everything. Now the interesting thing is when you get a cold or a flu, your bowel tolerance increases. So um, um, what I r recommend people do is that the first sign of a cold, you know, a tickle in the nose, a cough, a bit of a sneeze, take 10 grams of vitamin C straight away. If that doesn't cause diarrhea in an hour, take another 10 grams. If that doesn't cause diarrhea in an hour, take another 10 grams. Keep increasing until you get diarrhea. And as I say, the sicker you are, the more you can tolerate. So people with Epstein-Barr virus, which is a really nasty virus and a common cause of chronic fatigue, a common trigger of chronic fatigue, those patients can take 150 or sometimes 200 grams a day without getting diarrhea. Now, flip that on its head. What that tells us is that your bowel tolerance of vitamin C is a measure of your infectious load. Now that's an incredibly useful therapeutic tool because you don't have to go and do fancy tests. You don't have to go to expensive laboratories and be tested for a wide range of microbes. You just know what your infectious load is by how much vitamin C you can tolerate. Um, and I say that's an incredibly uh, helpful tool. Now there's a very interesting story about um, humans. It's humans, guinea pigs and um, fruit bats that can't make their own vitamin C. And this is, and if you titrate up from my little dog Nancy or my horses, we should be on a set at least 4 or 15 grams a day. So um, um, other animals can increase their own vitamin C according to demand. Humans can't do that. So we have to use our brains, we have to box clever, we have to take that vitamin C in order to get a, a, a comparable result. Again, those other animals, they make vitamin C from sugar. It's a four enzyme step to make vitamin C from sugar. And I think vitamin C and sugar are two sides of the same coin. And in nature, where there's lots of sugar, like in fruit and berries, there's lots of vitamin C. And vitamin C is probably how plants protect themselves against infection, because believe you me, all plants are susceptible to viruses, to bacteria, to parasites. You know, I'm going to call my book Life is an Arms Race. You know, you and I are a free lunch. All these microbes want to make themselves comfortably at home in our delicious and comfortable and, and, and easy bodies, and we're constantly fighting battles, you know, to keep them at bay. So vitamin C is very important. And then herbal me medications. You know, herbal medicine goes back thousands of years. In fact, um, um, one of the early herbalists in this country was Nicholas Culpepper. And um, I love the introduction to his book because he's like me, you know, he hates, you know, he wants to give power back to people to treat themselves. And in the introduction to his book, he says, uh, there are three um, um, professions that I hate most. Um, you know, one are uh, the priests who poison the soul, um, the doctors who poison the body, and the lawyers who poison your state. And the same is true today as, uh, of that, uh, as ever was. 
but we have a, um, a herbal medicines are very effective against infectious diseases. Why? Because plants too. I mean, a major form of defense for you and I against attackers is to run away from them. And, and animals can do that. Plants can't. So their defense against disease is to make themselves as poisonous and as toxic as they can. Similar viruses and bacteria that, that assail plants as assail us. And again, these plant treatments fall into two groups. There are those plants which improve the defenses and those plants which have specific antimicrobial action. So the three, so the first point is whatever your diet is, just use lots of herbs and spices. And it doesn't matter what they are, it doesn't matter if it's chili or if it's pepper or if it's rosemary in the garden or if it's basil or thyme, just use lots of them. Drink herbal teas because they all those products have antimicrobial actions and will help to improve the defences. There are three herbs that I've picked out because they come up time and time and time again in the treatment of a whole range of infectious diseases. And those three I picked out because they're delicious, because they are inexpensive and because um, 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 they're accessible and remarkably free from side effects. So you can't poison yourself by taking a lot of them. One is rhodiola, which is an, uh, a sedum from the Arctic. It makes delicious tea. So a spoon for that, boiling hot water, sip that through the day. The second is um, um, astragalus, which is a, a, a root. And again, that's delicious. It's delicious chewed. Um, uh, you can, it's delicious in soups and stews. And again, you can use a lot of it. And the third is cordyceps. Now, cordyceps is a mushroom. It has the most extraordinary life cycle, but it makes the most gorgeous chocolate. Uh, and, um, um, and equal parts of cordyceps, cocoa fat, and um, coconut oil, just mixed together and melted, um, and then um, put into ice cubes and put in the, in the fridge and eaten cold, is gorgeous. It's my treat. There's no sweeteners in there. It's very low carb, obviously rich in cordyceps, rich in coconut oil, which of course is very good at killing yeast, um, um, and, um, and coconut fat. It's the perfect fuel for the body. It really is a, a wonderful recipe. So before I treat any patient with any antimicrobial, they've got to put that in place. And for many, that's all they have to do. Just getting up to vitamin C with bowel tolerance, just getting on the PK diet, just getting those herbals in place, just taking those supplements, and they improve progressively. If my patients aren't improving or they get stuck at that point, then tests can be very helpful. And we get clues from how the illness started. Did it, was it triggered by glandular fever? Uh, was it triggered by a trip abroad? Um, was it triggered by insect bites? They're the obvious examples. Um, but we do have Armin Laboratories, which are incredibly helpful. Now, you don't need a doctor's referral to get tested at Armin Laboratories. Um, 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 there's a centre in this country that can send you the kits get your GP or whoever to take bloods and arm and do a whole range of testing for Lyme disease, for Bartonella, for Borrelia, for Epstein-Barr virus. They've recently extended their testing so it's much more specific and that is often very helpful because if you get a high antibody teeter against Mycoplasma or against Bartonella or against Lyme or whatever, that then allows one to hone treatment better. Now, one of the reasons I insist on my patients doing the basic workup first is because if they do that, well, then the chances of success from herbal treatments or antibiotics are greatly enhanced. So often I see people who have got a chronic fatigue syndrome, been told they've got Lyme, gone and had extreme expensive antibiotics, maybe intravenously, and got loads of nasty side effects from them, but they haven't done the basic workup. They haven't given their bodies the best chance of killing this wretched infection. So I almost have a deal with them. No, you can't have the antibiotics, you can't have the herbal preparations until you get this basic package in place. But then there are herbal preparations which are specific against virus. So all the herpes viruses, for example, are sensitive to Chinese skull cap. That's an incredibly useful um, um, uh, herb to use. Uh, there's some lovely work done by Dr. Martin Lerner, who's demonstrated that antivirals such as valacyclovir, which nails all the herpes viruses, he gets a, a large proportion of his patients well by giving them valacyclovir. Lyme, there's a similar package of herb for Lyme, ditto for Bartonella, mycoplasma, or whatever.